Pastor Richard Stadler, and I want to welcome you again to Talking Sunday Readings as we talk about the readings for Trinity Sunday in many churches uh, and for Pentecost II, uh, the second Sunday after Pentecost, or sometimes also called uh, Trinity I. <laughs> so um, depending on what church you're in and what the tradition is, uh, it may be labeled differently. And together with me is uh, Father Chuck Carter and Ann Carter. And so uh, we're going to look at Genesis 1, verse 1 to chapter 2, verse 4, which is the creation account. And then we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 7, because some churches will be hearing that as their Old Testament lesson. And then we'll look at 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 11 to 13. And we'll look at the gospel reading in Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. And since it's Trinity Sunday, we'll look for evidences of why they picked these readings for Trinity Sunday and any other insights we can share with you. So let's start with Genesis chapter um, 1. And um, in, it starts out the same way that John's Gospel starts out. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so you've got God the Father there. And then in the second verse, we Christians believe that it's referring to the third person of the Trinity, uh, to the Holy Spirit, when it says, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, where is the sun in all this? <laughs> if the whole Trinity are one God, and the Trinity participated in the creation, we go to John's Gospel, and he tells us in chapter 1, in the beginning was the word. That's a code name, Logos, for whoever he's talking about. And he says, he was with God in the beginning, and he was God. And so he identifies this Logos character as also divine. And then in verse 14, he explains who he's been talking about. And he says, we have beheld his glory. He is the son of the, the living God. And so he identifies in verse 14 that Jesus is the Logos and that the Logos was there together with the Father and the Spirit at creation, even though he's not mentioned in Genesis chapter 1. And then you've got the account of the creation. And uh, I don't want to put you guys on a terrible spot, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> Let me ask uh, Chuck and Ann. Um, every day God says, it was good or God saw that it was good. But one day he doesn't. Can you remember which day that was when he says, it, when he does, it does not say it was good? I noticed that. I, I went through and marked good on all of them, except for day two. Exactly. Now, uh, he, that's, it, he, he put a dome in the midst of the waters, separated the waters from the waters, and then it was the second day, and then we go right on. Right. Now, I was going to ask about that. The mm -hmm. Jewish rabbis have a, a, a legend about that, or a an explanation. Um, I don't know if it's legitimate or not, but the reason that uh, they say that it, good was not identified is because the only thing that happened during the second day was separating of stuff. And there was no unifying of stuff. And that God was creating the whole world as a residence for the crown of his creation, the humans. And so that's why the second day doesn't say good. But what is inter interesting is that there are two days in which it's twice said good. Mm -hmm. um, which of which those are those days? And you probably got that you know, marked in your text. Well, the fifth day, he made the animals, and that was good. And then he saw everything, and it was very good. Um, on the fifth day or the sixth day? Oh, I'm sorry, the sixth day. Yep. Yeah. So there and he then, is. Twice. And there's one other day where he says it is good twice in, in describing that day. Take a look at the third. I guess day. it was the third. He saw yeah. that it was good, right. and then he put vegetation, and God saw that it was good. Okay. Exactly. And, and the third day in Hebrew counting is Tuesday. Perfect. Sunday is about number one. Monday's number two. Tuesday's number two, uh, three. And for that reason, for many years, uh, Jewish tradition said that uh, the best day to get married was on Tuesday, because <laughs> that was the day when God said twice it was very good. And... Hmm. Uh, so uh, I don't know if that still is the tradition among Jews. I'll have to ask some of my friends. And, and yet it was, it's just kind of interesting to see how they take that back to the, the creation account. 
-hmm. And so you've got in the creation account then um, the creation on the first day of um, everything. And uh, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And then on the second day, you've got him uh, creating this expanse that uh, Ann referred to, dividing uh, the waters from the waters. And uh, we're not going to get into the details about how to picture all this uh, because we want to get on to uh, the creation of the humans. And then he creates the uh, dry land on the third day and the seas and also the vegetation all grows. And then on the fourth day, he creates the luminaries, the sun, the moon, and, and the stars. And all of them are oriented for the purpose of helping humans. And that's why when you read the descriptions of those, or as you listen to the description read to you, um, look for that because the purpose was not just so they could be up in the sky, uh, but that they had a purpose for humans to take advantage of, for navigating, for signs, for times, for months and years, calendars, so forth. And then um, on the fifth day, uh, he also creates the sea creatures and the birds. And on the sixth day, he starts out by creating the animals and has them come out of the ground. And we will see in chapter two that God uh, fashions the animals also out of the ground just as he fashioned the human. But there's a big difference coming. When he creates the humans, he says in the introduction of that in verse 26 of chapter one, um, let us make man in our image. And Christians have taken that as a hint of the Trinity having consultation among themselves and saying, okay, let's now create the human. And the word Adam in Hebrew can have three meanings, depending on what the context dictates. Uh, it can be a name, Adam. It can be a reference to the human. And it can be a reference to the male human. And here, it's obvious it's talking about the human because the next thing that's said about them, male and female, he created them. So his design for humans was that they were to propagate sexually with a male and a female component. And what's striking to me is that Tim Mackey um, is part of the Bible Project, and he has an interesting way of explaining the Trinity in the Godhead. He says, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one God. They are one community, but they are a community of love. And so as they are equal um, in the Godhead, they are also showing love with one another. And when he creates humans in the image of God, he's creating the first humans and all humans to be also a community of love. And that's what you expect from Adam and Eve. And apparently that's what they were before they fell into sin and they lost and they ruined it all. And so now in the Christian church, as God brings us Christ and Christ brings us renewal and new life and the promise of eternal life, we have the opportunity to try to recreate Eden, recreate this community of love and to share it with all people and not just with people who look like us and are dressed like us and in the same cultural strata as us. And so it's a fascinating um, description that I think is very useful. And so we can see that now in the creation account that God is saying, I've created this world for you humans I've created you humans to reflect the Trinity, to reflect our community of love in the way you treat each other. And after they ruin everything with the fall, which we aren't going to read about uh, in this Sunday, the next thing you hear is that God promises that he's going to send a redeemer who is going to give them life again, even though they brought in death. And he's going to give them renewal. And he says that that Savior will come and his he will be bruised, but he will crush the head of the serpent. So um, th there's some fascinating things in here about the creation of humans. And the last thing I want to draw attention to, and then we'll see if, if um, you, Ann, and, and Chuck have other things to add. There's been a lot of careless teaching about the creation of the male and the female. Um, in chapter one, you have the overview, the blueprint. And in chapter two, it then gives you a close-up version. Some critics of Christianity and some uh, others uh, have suggested that chapter two is a totally different account of the creation than chapter one. I don't believe that's true. I believe chapter one is the blueprint. 
And then in chapter two, you get a close-up version of it, just like a lot of films do that. They give you the overview and then they show you how you got to that. And one of the things about the blueprint is that both the male and the female were created in God's image. And they were both given authority over the whole creation to subdue it and to rule over it. And you don't see that in the English, but in the Hebrew, it's so obvious. All of the verbs are plural. When God tells Adam and Eve to rule over the world, to multiply, to replenish the earth. And all of the pronouns are also plural when he speaks to them and says he gives to them all this food to eat. He gives them all of these uh, responsibilities. And so it's not as if God is creating Adam to be the general and Eve to be his lieutenant. They are co-generals, co-regents of this creation. And so when you get to chapter two and God creates her and she makes uh, he makes her a, a helper suitable for Adam. In response to an observation early in the chapter, he says, it is not good for the man to be alone. That doesn't mean there's, there's something defective about people who are living single lives. Quite the contrary. What he's saying is the blueprint says that I've created the human as a male and a female, and all I've got so far in the early part of chapter two is the male component. Now we've got to make this complete and finish the job. And so the reason it's not good for Adam to be alone is because the, the blueprint isn't finished. And so he creates Eve then to be his partner. So I think those are some wonderful insights because in the perfect world, they were created to be totally cooperative, loving, supportive, a community of love. And when a, a husband and a wife put their lives together, they were recreating, and they can recreate and try to show and reflect that same community of love for the world to see. And so that when the world looks at their marriage and see how loving they are, how sensitive they are to one another and how they treat one another, then they can also see, oh, and that's kind of a reflection of God who is loving and who is gracious and who is kind and sensitive. So that's um, uh, a few things that I thought were worth underscoring in Genesis. Um, anything you wanna to add to that or questions you wanna raise? Well, I have one, if I may. I, um, I copied uh, my text off of the Revised Common Lectionary website, which I do every time. And it is the, um, it is the new revised um, standard version. And in, and in that version, and I, I checked on a number of other versions on if anybody out there who is watching um, Bible Gateway, um, you can get every version of the Bible right there on your, at your fingertips. Um, but the New Revised Standard says, the earth was a formless void, darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. And that bothered me a little bit. Um, I looked up the Orthodox Jewish version, says it's the Ruach Elohim, which is the breath of God. And I don't like that some people might hear that that it's a wind from God, not the breath of God. So well, if anybody has a comment. That's a very good point um, to raise because um, Jews would never agree with our Christian understanding that the spirit is, is the third Holy Spirit, that, mm -hmm. that it is a, a, a component of God. And the Hebrew is ruach, which means it can be wind, it can be breath, it can be, uh, and, and it's used regularly when it describes wind blowing and so forth. So we have the advantage of the interpretation, the inspired interpretation that the New Testament gives us. And in the inspired New Testament, we are told that Father, Son, Holy Spirit are all God. And therefore, we'll see that in some of the other readings that you're gonna be talking about. And so that's a hint to us when we read the entire sweep of scripture, Old and New Testament, to see a hint of the Trinity there and that the Ruach, the breath of God or the wind of God is really also the spirit of God. And that's a legitimate translation of Ruach. Uh, so, uh, but you will run into translations that will adopt that way of mm -hmm. translating. It's, it's all in the preposition and that's what's interesting. Yeah. Um, they say it's the wind from rather than a wind of, as though it's the wind, right. God just creates some sort of a wind and blows it rather than the wind coming actually from, proceeding from God somehow. Mm -hmm. So 
we, no wonder people struggle with the Bible when there's so many different versions and how do you know which one is exactly right? I guess that's my point. Well, and what's interesting is there is no preposition in the Hebrew text. I'm just looking at it now. It mm -hmm. just says Ruach Elohim. So it's just, uh, it's assumed to be a construct which takes uh, the other, the following word as part so, of it. Yeah, so, it's a possessive. Uh, and, and so uh, they're connected. Um, and so um, it, it, it is certainly a literal translation of the Hebrew, but um, I, I, I'm prejudiced. I, I prefer to take the New Testament implications and, and read into it the, the, uh, an evidence of the Holy Spirit there at the creation. So, uh, and I know that my Jewish friends would not agree with me on this interpretation of the Genesis account. So, uh, anything else you see on Genesis before we go to Isaiah? Well, then let's take a look at Isaiah 6, verses 1 to 7, because some churches are going to read that as their Old Testament lesson for this Sunday. A reading from Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him, each had six wings, with two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. And the context for this is that the first five chapters have been laying out the condemnation and the judgment of God over against Judah and Jerusalem. And now you get to the sixth chapter where Isaiah is summoned by God to be his prophet. And these prop, these angels, these seraphim, um, gather together and they are sh shouting, holy, 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 kadosh, 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 which is an adjective. And why do they say it three times? Now, we Christians are obviously reading something into the text based on our prejudice that the whole the New Testament has worked in us, but um, it's a hint to us that uh, this is also a God who has three persons. Uh, one is holy, another is holy, and the third is holy. All three are holy. Um, now, uh, our Jewish friends aren't going to accept that uh, interpretation, or some Hebrew Christian scholars are not going to uh, accept that inference that we draw from it. Um, but we admit that we're drawing an inference from that. And in this section, um, Isaiah realizes that he's come in contact with the manifestation of God. And he right away expresses, I, I'll surely die. Uh, and that, that's a belief in uh, Old Testament um, Judaism that if you look at God and you see God, uh, it's going to kill you. And it goes all the way back to the time of Moses where Moses articulates that, and he says, um, God says to Moses in Exodus 33, when Moses wants to see God's glory, he says, no, you can't see my glory. Uh, I'm here, I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock, and my backside, I'll let you see. But if you see my face, he says, literally, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And Manoah, the father of Samson, also has a visitor who he assesses is God in the flesh, or um, and and he then uh, says to his wife, we're going to surely die because we've just seen God. So that belief was a very in embedded belief that comes right down to the time of Isaiah, uh, that you, you can't see God and survive because the holy God is just too holy in his presence for unholy people to endure it and to put up with it. Yeah. 
-hmm. And so then to assure him that he's not going to die and that he's been called to service, he places his hot coal on his lips to say, now you've been given uh, forgiveness. Now you've been redeemed. And so now you can go out and serve as my prophet to speak forth my word. And my last point on this text is, I think that that's a wonderful reminder to anybody who is called into God's service that we lose credibility if we ask other people to repent if they don't see us repenting. And that the finest way that the Christian church can manifest the grace of God to this world is by being on our knees. And I think with all of the trouble that's going on in our world right now, and with all of the destruction and the riots and the uh, terrible destruction that's going to um, minority businesses and they're being ruined for life, uh, is that we Christians have a responsibility to get down on our knees and let the whole world see, come join us. Join us on your knees. Because if you're on your knees, you're not gonna be able to loot and to destroy buildings. If you're on your knees, you're not gonna be able to hurt other people. If you're on your knees, you're not going to be destructive and hateful because you'll be saying to God, I'm sorry for my sins. And that's why Isaiah could not go out and do his ministry before first. He received that assurance that his repentance would be effective because there is forgiveness waiting for him from a gracious God. And I think that's a, a powerful reminder in this very short section of scripture for all of us. I don't know if you have any questions or thoughts about that, but your turn. Okay. I think and it was well said, Dick. Very well, well said. Let's go on to, um, Anne, you get to lead us through 2 Corinthians 13. Uh, yeah, 2 Corinthians 13, there's three verses, so it's nothing like uh, chapters 1 and 2 of Genesis. A reading from 2 Corinthians. Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order, listen to my appeal, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Um, the first point I would make is that uh, tying it to um, Trinity, the Trinity Sunday, which we're in, verse 13 says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, there's one, the love of God, there's two, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, that's three, be with you all. It's a, a blessing that Paul uses, um, but denoting each person of the Trinity. Yeah. The other thing I would say in verse 11, uh, it's a, this, these verses are a farewell of Paul to the congregation. But he says, put things in order, listen to my appeal, agree with one another, live in peace. And as you alluded to, Dick, in these days that we're living in now, I, I, can, I see from Paul's words that it's a conscious choice we all have to do these things. It's a conscious choice to live in peace, and it's a conscious choice to agree with each other, to find a place where, where you are in some sort of, a, of harmony so that you can create some sort of a relationship. And uh, Paul says, when you do those things, here's a promise. The God of love and peace will be with you. It's, it's a relational thing, but it's an active thing. Uh, we as Christians don't, aren't to sit on a fence. Uh, we are to actively choose godly ways, and God will be with us when we do. That's a great reminder, Ann, um, because um, he does start out that by saying that um, the God of peace and love will be with you. And mm -hmm. so it's God who enables us to be able to show that peace, that love, that concern for justice, that concern for um, fairness for people who are oppressed and for who people who have been mistreated, but also a respect for property. And so I, I, one of the great things that came, it's a very small silver lining that came out of this 
uh, the riots and so on, is the number of volunteers that just showed up, total strangers, and helped some of these entrepreneurs to clean up and to do the best they could to fix things up after the terrible destruction. And so um, that's- They did the first thing in this, in this listing. They put things in order. Yeah. And justice, part of justice is putting things in order in society so that no one is taken advantage of and no one is hurt. As Paul talked over and over about widows and orphans, they were to be taken care of. And the, the, our duty is to not set ourselves apart and not to present ourselves as victims, but to look at the love of God working through us. Yeah. Anyway, I'm, I'm done with my soapbox. I'll turn it over to you, Chuck. Right. Well, well, before we go on, I, I just think it's really neat. In verse 13, he says, all the saints greet you. And that word saint is used regularly through the New Testament to picture believers. And so he's reminding Christians by implication, all of you are saints. And if we see ourselves as saints, that's got to have an effect on how we behave and how we treat other people. If we remember that we are exponents of, of God. So, yeah. Uh, it's, it's just a small thing, but I think it's a big reminder. Uh. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. The eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, and remember that I am with you always to the end of the age. Well, if we turn to Matthew 28, uh, another brief reading, uh, Matthew 28 verses 16 through 20 we have what is commonly referred to as the Great Commission, where Jesus uh, meets his disciples in Galilee uh, to the mountain to which he had directed them, uh, which often is thought to be Mount uh, Arbel, um, where we were able to go and, and stand on top of, uh, where you can kind of, from the vantage that gives you, kind of see the whole world into which Jesus sends his, his disciples. Um, and he commands them to go, uh, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am always with you to the close of the age. So here I think for Christians uh, interpreting Holy Scripture, uh, this, uh, the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, you see here uh, a direct reference to the, the Trinity, uh, an early formulation of the Trinity. And it's not in the names of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It is in the name, singular, of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, so, uh, of course, Trinitarian uh, theology and identity of God as, as the Holy Trinity took a couple of centuries uh, before it was fully fleshed out. Um, we see that 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 fleshing out doesn't take place uh, uh, fully until the uh, creed of Nice uh, Nice Constantinopolitan Creed in 382, um, where we have kind of a, a, a full explicit um, identification of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, um, not three gods but one God. Um, you know, one in one in essence uh, and and in Trinity of persons. Uh, it takes a while to kind of flesh out that technical language. But here we have, uh, as, as the account here from Jesus' mouth, um, we are baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Um, but I want to back up first. Uh, we're, we're still kind of uh, getting out of the Easter season. And um, there is this interesting little detail, verse 17 at least the translation I'm using, which is the Revised Standard Version. And when they saw Jesus, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Yeah. I was going to ask on that, too. What, were, what did they doubt? Yeah, that's a well, good question. Yeah, I, I, think, um, I think it just goes to show uh, the, 
you know, there's still room for doubt, you know, regardless. Uh, there's no, there's no, there's nothing, you know, kind of touching back on this idea of God as a community of love. Uh, there is no compulsion in love and there's, and God does not, um, uh, you might say God does not force us, if you will, uh, to believe in him, you know, now, um, maybe that's another conversation theologically in terms of, you know, kind of predestination and stuff like that. But, um, there is, I, I think the relationship of faith, uh, with God is one that, um, you know, is this, is this real? Maybe it's too good to be true. We're standing here on Mount, on this mountain. There's Jesus, you know, maybe it's too good to be true. I'm sure though, that after, uh, having gone out, if, as the disciples did, um, I'm pretty sure that over time, many of those doubts would have been put to rest, but, but you know, in the moment, it's still probably pretty fresh and new that uh, um, it would make sense that you would have some suspension of, of belief here at, at this moment. But I don't know. Any other thoughts? Do you think that maybe this is a hint about how much the disciples needed Pentecost? Because after Pentecost, um, we don't see any evidence of doubt. Right. But here at this stage, they're still working through their um, I don't know what they doubted, but the text doesn't tell us what they doubted, yeah. whether he was uh, arisen, whether that was really him. Uh, we just don't know. But um, but Pentecost makes all the difference. And mm. uh, so uh, that, that might be just a, a hint leading up to it. Yeah. 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 Just for curiosity, um, uh, when I was in the seminary in my senior year, our dogmatics professor made us write an essay on what is the significance of Anne in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, uh, 19? And um, we, we were supposed to come to an understanding that if you understand grammar, that the word and is a conjunction that coordinates equal things. And therefore, theologically, it's important to see the text carefully and see the details in the text that link Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to each other as equal components of the Godhead. And uh, it's just kind of fascinating when Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in, as you said, the name of the Father, not names. And so there, this is not a, a pluralistic God. Uh, but what is interesting is that that would call to mind, I think, in the minds of many Jews, the Shema, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now that's kind of a mystery. Mm -hmm. uh, the word for um, our God is a plural uh, in form, uh, but uh, the Jews believe that there was only one God and that he was a singular God. And so similarly here, Jesus is saying God is only one, but he manifests himself in these three persons, all of whom are equal. Yeah. <laughs> and so it, it's, and some of the biggest things are said with the smallest words in the Christian text. Yeah. Well, with that, uh, thank you for joining us for this episode of Talking Sunday Readings. Uh, we wish you a, a blessed and safe Trinity Sunday to you and your families, wherever you may be. And join us again next week uh, as we pick it up again with another episode of Talking Sunday Readings.